Good evening, everybody. It's kind of nippy today, huh? Kind of cold? Yeah, I'm, I'm normally used to the, the uh, summer heat, summer extreme heats. Uh, and so when it gets cold quickly, I tend to get cold quickly. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, brother, for the music. And uh, thank you for everyone coming today. Um, let's open up the prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for um, all the trials you've given us, Lord, and through the storms, Lord. Thank you for uh, building us within those storms character, Lord, and thank you for the wisdom and, and through the experience that you've given us, Lord, showing your godly wisdom, Lord. And today, Lord, we pray about the wisdom that you're going to be showing us that you revealed to Solomon, Lord, and uh, Solomon is speaking to us, Lord, in Ecclesiastes, Lord. Uh, we pray for these things to, to come into fruition, Lord, within each and every single uh, one of us here, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So last week has been quite a week, right? Um, a lot going on in our world today. Um, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 7, uh, verses 19 through 20, okay? And I'm going to open up with a little bit of uh, kind of what's been going on with me in the past, the past month. Um, I have been going through a lot of personal storms, and I've wondered, am I the problem? And it's funny because tonight's title is, is just that. And uh, it's even more coincidental, right, um, how God works. Roger had given me this, this, uh, this assignment, um, I think about two months ago. And so it's, it's been kind of a strange revealing how God has been working within my life the past month. And I had to take a self-inventory to see, is this me? Is this my fault going on? I had to pray to God for wisdom, protection, and humbleness. And reading the text actually helped guide me in determining what to, to really pray for in the storms of my life that was been going on. And um, so I'm going to give you an example. This past week, and some of you know the, the work I do. So on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I've been cursed at, right? I, I serve a type of demographic that um, can be a bit hard to serve. And that just comes with the, the, the work uh, title when it comes to serving that type of demographic. Um, and even yesterday, uh, someone flipped me off from their car. Just stick the window out and flipped me off. And in one instance, my wife was with me. And uh, we had said, she had said, we love you. you know, we love you. So we pray for them. And I also pray to be steadfast in these storms. I prayed specifically for, for wisdom, for humbleness, and I prayed for protection because I knew that these things that were going on just seemed like a heavy bombardment. And it was like nonstop, uh, a shell just firing squad at me. One day was five things. One day was ten things. Another day was three things. And I'm like, okay, what's, let me back up and see what's going on here. Let me take an inventory. Is this, is this me? Am I seeing this? Is this because of any actions I've done or, or behavior? So self-inventory to take a look within ourselves. So through the storms, I prayed for wisdom and protection. Through seeking wisdom, I found that I wasn't the problem. But I had been given a solution to the problems that were coming my way. Next, I prayed for courage and truth. Because now what do I do with this information? So I prayed for God to, to re reveal to me what to do in these situations and to give me courage, boldness, to be honest and truthful and to be humbled. We have to understand where we are in the storms. And that's one thing that I did pray about. What's going on? What is my stance? Is this worth fighting? Is this worth defending myself? If I defend my reputation, am I just defending just me? Am I being selfish in this moment? But I can tell you that wisdom gives you a fighting chance. It gives you clarity out on the battlefield or in the storm that you're in. But we need to be specific and pray for God's wisdom, not our own wisdom. So in Ecclesiastes, verse 19 to 20. 
one wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. So again, verse 19, one wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Verse 20, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. So we get two takeaways. We see in, in verse 19 the, the power of wisdom or wisdom. And in 20, we see not a single human is perfectly righteous. Now, if you were to read verses 19 to 20 as a true false statement, it could read like this. True or false, one wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. True or false, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. You'd read that and you'd say, oh, true. Very, very true. In fact, when it comes to leading a town and a city, we citizens want that from our leaders, to, to be wise. And from what we can gather from the Bible wisdom, especially here, is, is this understanding of, of knowing God's way, knowing morality, or knowing right from wrong, just, just knowing and taking the right steps to do the right thing. One of the things that we want in our leader, because in this specific content here, it can also, it's an analogy as well. One wise person, right? So Solomon's saying wisdom is great, so great that it's, it's better than your leaders of your town and their intelligence of leading and governing. Wisdom is, is much more. It's what we want. But that's not always the case. In verse 20, it can be read as a, a rule of thumb, right? Something to never forget. And that is, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Without a show of hands, but how many of you have been had before? <laughs> or where, where is that, that, state, that uh, phrase that, um, oh, you bought a lemon, right? You bought, you've been had. People can take advantage of our good intent, our willingness to do good and see good in others. Others can take advantage of, and then we can be had. People have sinful intentions and sinful desires. Wisdom is choosing to do what's right instead of giving in to our sinful nature. Everyday people understand that rule of thumb, right? Many of you understand, well, not everyone is, is, is perfect. Not everyone's going to do good for me. I'm going to get had because I got, I got had before. And I've learned from that. So not all people are perfect. And the Bible goes further and says, because of the fall, right, in the Garden of Eden, we're all born imperfect. We're all born sinners, When I was reading this, I thought back to my life story. And I remember my time uh, as an executive for a nonprofit agency uh, during like the training phase and that two months that you're gonna be kind of probationary training. Uh, there's textbooks you read. There was a week of uh, class training we, I took, I went to Texas for. And uh, all of it was about people. Serving people, sales training, discovering what it's like to talk to someone to, to get them to buy into what you're selling, right? And there were two interesting books that stood out, and I found those, we, we, we joked about them because they were, they were just uh, books that we didn't really need it in the moment. And so one of them, I think you guys probably know them, uh, one is called The Energy Bus by John Gordon, and the other one is Give Him the Pickle by Robert Farrell. I don't know if you guys ever heard of them, okay. So, the energy bus. It's about staying positive through challenges and surrounding yourself with positive people and understanding that there's negative people in your life that are leeching off of your positivity, right? And I remember in class, there was a joke. The joke was this. In every department or team, there's always someone who is negative. 
a negative person of that group in your department or your team. This person stirs trouble. They, they gossip. They spread negativity. They take away from productivity. They bring stress and anxiety. They just make the workplace harder to, to work in or the team to make it harder to function. The joke was this. If you don't know who that person is, chances are you're that person. You just might be the problem. In the other book, um, Give Him the Pickle, we see goodness. And this is by Robert Farrell. And this book is more about like uh, the approach of ultimate customer service. And the quote was, uh, Robert is saying, the author, Robert, um, I'm in the people business, and serving people for a living is what I do. And this is how I serve. Robert tells about a story that happened. He's a restaurant owner, and there's an unhappy customer. And the unhappy customer always came and purchased the same thing. It was like a sandwich with a side of pickle with an extra pickle for free. He had been coming long enough to the point where the staff and the, and the managers know, oh, this guy, give him the pickle, you know, et cetera. He's, he's a loyal customer. Well, one day that loyal customer came into the restaurant, and uh, they charged him 75 cents. He's like, what, what are you, why are you charging me 75 cents? I'm your loyal customer. I'm always here. I give you guys business. Oh, sir, we, we always charge the 75 cents. The guy goes on and says, no, 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 you don't understand. I, I always get the extra pickle because I'm a loyal customer and I, I tip well. Well, sir, you know, this is our, our guidelines and we have to sell the extra pickle for 75 cents. The customer leaves behind the tray. He gets up, walks away. He writes a letter to the restaurant and that's where Robert receives this letter. And he's wondering, why didn't you just give him the pickle? We lost a customer. We lost a loyal customer. All because you wanted to charge him 75 cents? And, and, and the, what Robert does in this book of giving the pickle, he takes that, talks about giving the pickle in the sense that you go the extra mile for people. You show compassion. You, you give a little bit. You sacrifice to gain so much more. It could be a loyal friend. You just sacrifice, you show compassion, you go the extra mile. In that book, I remember very well uh, because I took that to heart and I thought, wow, it's more than just that 75 cents, it's more than just that pickle. And these books, I remember, laid out for me a set of guidelines that I still use today with the nonprofit work. And I'm reminded when I'm reading chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes that I choose to serve others the best I can, and sometimes I'm able to go the extra mile. Also, praying for the compassion and the sympathy and and the grace to have in those moments when people do need help. Praying for wisdom to know right and wrong, to also help in my own decision-making and to know if I'm the problem. King Solomon is telling us a lot in chapter 7. Solomon lays out in the beginning uh, uh, like guidelines we ought to follow or remember when when dealing with people or how to carry ourselves in society. Also, he teaches us that too much wisdom and too much wickedness, um, he gets into that, we're going to talk about it right now. One more thing, he gives us a testimonial of his findings which we're about to read right now. So again, verses 19 and 20, which is one wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town, and not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. So what I like to do is I'm going to read chapter 7. And you're going to see um, there's like uh, segments in chapter 7 where he's telling us um, his findings. And he's, he's, like, teaching us these things. But then it gets into a bit of a testimonial, and he's, like, note-taking. Well, don't do this because I did it, and it doesn't work out, and you don't do it, you know. So chapter 7, 
A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you are born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties after all everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. A fool's laughter is quickly gone like thorns crackling in a fire. This also is meaningless. Extortion turns wise people into fools, and bribes corrupt the heart. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. Don't long for the old days. This is not wise. And then in verse 11, Solomon goes on to talk about this. Wisdom is even better when you have money. Both are benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Accept the way God does things. For who can straighten that he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. Then verse 19, one wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you, for you know how often you have cursed others. Then in 23, I have always tried my best to let wisdom guide me, guide my thoughts and actions. I said to myself, I am determined to be wise, but it didn't work. Wisdom is always distant and difficult to find. I searched everywhere, determined to find wisdom and to understand the reason for things I was determined to prove to myself that wickedness is stupid and that foolishness is madness. I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Her passion is a snare and her soft hands are chains that who are pleasing to God will escape her. But sinners will be caught in her snare. So this is my conclusion, says the teacher. I have discovered that this After looking at the matter from every possible angle, though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. But I did find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. So what do we see here? We see wisdom, we see imperfection. In verse 19 and 20, they they kind of highlight what's going on in chapter 7. The power of wisdom and imperfectly, I put down imperfectly righteous. So in Ecclesiastes um, chapter 7, verse 15 to 18, concerning wisdom or lack thereof, too much of it can come off as a false righteousness. It can breed pride within you. It can make us get into that whole legalism battle of our faith. It makes you become wise on your own merit or understanding and not God's wisdom. You become of a, a know-it-all, right? I already know that. I know this. I know that, right? Your activities, this, was, this one was interesting. Um, I have here a study Bible, and it talked about your 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 activities in church, right, your faith works, they become diluted because of self-wisdom. You may even start to think that you know better than God. Too much wisdom is not good. And that's what we're getting from verse 15 to 18. Too much of it is, is not good. And then, of course, we know the, the other side, 
too much wickedness, too much sinfulness can lead to a short life. That we know. We know that it also is self-destructive to keep living a sinful life. And for the Christian, uh, it turns you away from God, leads others to sinfulness, ultimately leading to an eternal death. Now the second point, which is imperfectly righteous, I remember, and many of you might too, and I believe it's in Kings, when, when David um, is on his deathbed, King David's on his deathbed, um, Solomon, there's a whole family drama that happens, and Solomon is pretty much summoned and is, be, is made king, right? And he prays. He prays for wisdom, and God does him even better than that. He makes him the wisest person. He's, he's anointed. So Solomon the wise, Solomon the anointed, the king, he's blessed. He's protected by God. He's deemed righteous. But even the wisest man on earth is saying to us the imperfections of himself and things that we ought to take note from. Don't eavesdrop, he mentions, right? Because you'll probably hear people curse you. And then you might even be reminded also, also of how many times you've cursed others. So going back from like last week when I've heard people cussing at me, serving them, I thought to myself, that they, they just need love. They need the care. They need compassion. They don't need me to be, to be angry or mean towards them. And that's something that we as Christians shouldn't do. Solomon tells us in uh, 21, 20, 26, that he's tried to seek wisdom and did not find it. Now, a couple of things that we see is in, in uh, verse 13, accept the way God does things. And then in Solomon's conclusion, God created people to be virtuous. It is God's wisdom that we're trying to seek, not the wisdom of the world. So Solomon tells us from his experience that it's God's wisdom that we should try to seek daily. And the one thing that we ought to watch out for are traps. And Solomon lays out in his, his uh, situation here, um, in verse 26, it starts off with, I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. So he's been there, he's, he's lived it, and he's telling us these things. There are these traps that play a, a rhythmic tune to our sinful nature so that we can be ensnared and tempted to it and get into it, get involved with sinful ways and destroy us to watch out for those things, to pray about those things, to pray for protection. And then what we see in verses 9 and 20 is that wisdom is great, but in verse 20, everyone is not righteous. Right? Verse 19, the wisest is worth more than 10 leading citizens. But in verse 20, no one's righteous. What is Solomon showing us through chapter 7? He is showing us that there is this balance. See, the opening of chapter 7 is why I wanted to read the chapter. The first verses 1 through 10, there's a lot of uh, this is positive and then this is negative, right? A good reputation is more valuable than a costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you are ever born. And you'll see this in verses 1 through 10. He, he's giving us these guidelines. These, there, there's this and then there's, there's this. There's, there's some back and forth here of truth, a positivity and negativity, a high and there's a low. And in verses 11 and 14, he specifically talks about wisdom and prosperity that they only come from God. Wisdom comes from God. If you prosper in life, that's a huge blessing. But even then, it comes from God. 
But then he switches it up again in verse 15 and 27. Solomon tells us that there is this balance. So he lays this out for us to, to make us see the high and low, the positivity, the negativity. He talks about wisdom coming from God. And then we see when he's teaching us in 19 and 20, there is this balance. Too much wisdom, too much wickedness. So there's a midpoint. And Solomon was finding the midpoint here. I was searching for it, could not find it. But hey, there's, there's these extremes going on. We got to be in the middle. And we got to search for that through God's wisdom. To know in the world we live in, the sinful world we live in, where, as Christians, should we be? Especially now in the world we live in. A lot of people angry on social media right now. Many of you know why. As Christians, what do we do? You can revert back to Joshua, right? Right before they they take over um, the city, uh, there was uh, a person in the night that came to Joshua with a sword. Joshua asks, are you with us or against us? The person replies, I'm for God. I'm, I'm with God. I'm the, the, the leader of the, the heavenly har- armies. This is what you should do. We need to choose God in, in our society, in our schools, in our churches, especially in our churches. It can't be about us as humans. It has to be about God, about Jesus Christ. And it seems here that Solomon, at the end of chapter 7, he's going through this fight, the wisest person on earth, searching for wisdom. To later on tell us that fear God, fear the Lord, God gives us wisdom. It's God's wisdom, not our own. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. He's telling the disciples before he sends them out, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Jesus is telling his disciple this just before mentioning the coming persecution the disciples will face by going into the world and proclaiming the gospel. We must be attentive, attentive and know what is true, what is a lie. You've got to be harmless as a dove, not to manipulate and not to react with indifference, but be compassionate, be graceful. One last thing I want to share with you guys while working in nonprofit sector and serving people, I've come to see there are these world fantasies where people wishing for a different world to live in. Having a mindset, I've heard before, that everyone's evil, everyone has hate, everyone wants to kill each other. Or the other side, everyone is righteous, everyone's perfect, nothing going on here. Or thinking that only you are righteous. And I've seen this. I've seen people actually live in our society. Some of you probably know some neighbors like that. I have heard many things of people wishing the world was one way and not the other. Right? People tell themselves, this is the fantasy I live in right here, right now, and I wish it to be that fantasy. I've heard about robots taking over the world and the layout of how that is going to work out. I've heard of the resurrection of dinosaurs in the future. Then those dinosaurs 
being used to dominate the world. I have heard of lizard men, lizard men. There's a reptilian race out there who have infiltrated the White House and have been there for hundreds of years. I have heard different scenarios of how the world would end and when. What's going to happen? What's going to play out? We as individuals and as a society play out all these fantasies about the world we live in. Believing reality to be one way and wishing for the other world to be another way. We hear things about without questioning where that information is coming from. Where is this coming from? How did you hear about these robots, these dinosaurs, the lizard men? Why would you think that everyone wants to kill you? Or why would you think that everyone's so perfect, nothing's going wrong here, no one needs help, no one needs saving? It's like we're being gaslighted by the world, by society. And from what we can gather from the Bible, the world only knows Satan. Are we being tricked by Satan? Are we being used? Are we being sold lemons? We're being misled by Satan's followers and those who have given into his ways. Our minds, your minds, my mind, everybody's mind is being tricked with illusions. So we have to pray, and I want to stress this. You pray for God to show you what is real and what is not real. Again, what is real, what is not real. Every day you wake up, you're going to be bombarded by information by people, by your phone, by media, what is real, what is not real, because then that is going to help you decide where you stand. There are extremes going on, and Solomon is telling us wisdom of God is what we need, God's wisdom, not our own wisdom, not the wisdom from the world. So we got to pray for reality. God, show us what is real, what is not real. So we know where we're at. We can pray for wisdom. We can pray for that fight. We can pray for should we fight. Spiritually praying for protection. Praying for humbleness. And remember, God has sent you all out in a world of wolves. So be shrewd like snakes and be graceful and harmless like doves. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this uh, message, Lord. Thank you for uh, your servant, Lord, King Solomon, Lord, for, for writing everything down, for explaining to us and peoples to come, Lord, and generations to come, Lord, and kingdoms to come, Lord, uh, of your wisdom, of your ways, Lord. I pray today that we all know the realities of the world we live in, Lord, that we know your word, we know how that word is used in our world and how we can apply it to our own lives, Lord. I pray for guidance. I pray for wisdom for everybody here, protection, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that your will be done. Amen.